I just want to start by, by making an observation that we are surrounded by signs. We are surrounded by signs. Everywhere we go, there's signs, there's signals, there's indicators that are designed to give us an idea. They're designed to give us a clue about what's going on, what's happening, something important. A week ago, we were notified, if you live in this area, we were notified that Route 30 and Route 222 were going to be shut down, right? If you miss that sign, if you miss that indicator, there's a problem. You're stuck in traffic for, for quite a long time. Um, there's signs with technology, my phone. I get important notices for meetings and, and uh, alarms to wake up in the morning and, and snooze and wake up again, and it keeps telling me. Uh, I remember a few years ago where I had forgotten to set up a sign on my technology and my neighbor texted my wife and my wife texted me and said, is the grill on? Well, I hadn't cleaned the grill in a while, so it was on all right and it was burning pretty good. And I'd forgotten that I turned it on to warm it up for what I was about to cook. We need these, we, sometimes we miss these signs and indicators. In our homes, we have indicators, we have signs. Signals that tell us, okay, there's something wrong with the carbon monoxide in your house. Or maybe there's a smoke detector that's, that's starting to beep or maybe it's just the battery's dead and you just got to exchange, change the battery out. Last week, Pastor Kirk, he shared some of the, the meds that he was, that he's, that helps his body when his body indicates there's something going on. And he had all these medicines up here that when he has this ache or that pain or feeling this or feeling that, uh, it's another indicator of when our, when our bodies or uh, things are not going the way they're supposed to go when something's not quite right. But what do we do when we miss these signs? What happens when somehow we, we don't see them, we don't hear them, we don't know about them? What happens when we're not paying attention to these important matters? One of the signs recently in my life is that uh, I drive a 2010 silver RAV4 that I absolutely love. I know you're thinking, 2010, I love it. I don't want to cha change it. I love it. It's awesome. It's my favorite car I've ever owned. And, uh, but it has just under 179,000 miles. It's 178,900 I just crossed this morning. Now, I know that because I tend to miss certain signs with my car. It's going to come out. There we go. I haven't pulled out this oil dipstick in probably over a decade because I've got other indicators, right? You ever have an indicator, right? An indicator that the, 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 the you know, signal goes on on your dashboard and says, service required. Well, sometimes I ignore this sign so much, this indicator so much, that that doesn't even come on. My car starts creaking and screeching and I'm making all those funny sounds when you call your, your mechanic and goes, um, it's making these sounds like, well, like what? Like, and I think they do that just to make you, you feel stupid for missing the sign. Well, I feel stupid because I'm constantly missing that sign. But the problem is my, the oil in that car, which I love, but that oil just burns faster and faster and faster. So what happens is it's not operating the way it's intending to operate. This kind of indicator, the, the dipstick, the oil dipstick, or the dashboard, or the number that he actually put the sticker on my rear view mirror, like my, my, the one in the middle, to say, hey, don't forget this. So now I have a signal in here to tell me, check your oil, or check your mileage, make sure you're, che you're checking your oil all the time. Now I share that to say that, that, that we all miss signs. Anybody else miss signs like that? Yeah? I mean, I was very thankful that that actually was the oil indicator because I wasn't sure it was the right one. <laughs> I'm not mechanically or technically inclined, so. But there's another sign that's more important, another indicator that we need to be paying attention to that we often ignore, and that's our emotions. We, 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 we have the, the, these emotions, but they're a sign, they're a signal, they're an indicator of something that's going on inside of us. They help us live our lives the way that we're supposed to live our lives, the way that we're designed to live our lives. But has anybody ever heard, or has anybody ever said, you're letting your emotions get the best of you? You're letting your actions 
or your emotions determine your actions. I mean, it's not a good thing when someone's saying that to you, right? What they're saying is you're being controlled by your emotions. Now, I don't know what you do with your emotions, but we're given emotions to help us think through things, to help us process what's going on inside, inside of us so that we can live the way we're intended to live. God gave us emotions, and they're meant to be an indicator for us. They're meant to be a sign to us, to tell us something important. John Bloom, a staff writer for Desiring God Ministries, says this. He said, God designed your emotions to be gauges, not guides. They're designed to be gauges, not guides. They're meant to report to you, not dictate to you. He says, the pattern of your emotions, but not every caffeine-induced or sleep-deprived one, will give you a reading on where your hope is because they're wired into what you believe and value and how much. And because our emotions are wired into our fallen natures as well as into our regenerated natures, sin and Satan have access to them and will use them to try and manipulate us to act faithlessly. That's why our emotional responses to temptation can seem like imperatives, that you must do this, rather than indicatives, meaning here's what you're being told. Emotions aren't imperatives. They're not your boss. They're indicatives. Their reports. Hope, our lives are often a mess because we don't pay attention to our emotions. They're often a problem because we tend to suppress and rather than address our emotions. And what they're intending to indicate is really going on within us and around us. This morning, we're continuing our series, Broken but not defeated. And our focus this morning is on checking our lives when we're broken emotionally and especially by sin. We're looking at Psalm 51. I invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 51. And we're going to see David expressing, not suppressing his emotions. Finally. We're going to see David and what he's experiencing as a result of his sin, guilt, and shame and regret. So what do we do with guilt and shame and regret? And we're going to see that both he and hopefully we are learning how when we're broken emotionally by sin, there are advantages to expressing our sin. And I'm calling them liberating advantages because they free us. They release us from the guilt and the shame and the regret that we often have. And what they release us from is, is from keeping us from experiencing God who wants to forgive us, who wants to change us. And whether you believe it or not, he still wants to use us. So let's begin with the first liberating advantage that frees us when we're broken emotionally by sin. And the first one is we experience God who, who forgives us for our sin. The first three verses... David writes this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know, <laughs> I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Now, the sin that David's talking about is no minor sin. It's, it, it, it's, it's a major sin. And for nearly a year, David had been suppressing and trying to cover up this sin. He wasn't addressing it. He knew he was guilty, but tragically, tragically, he refused to deal with his sin of adultery. At the time when kings in, in their day went out to war, David stayed home. And he sees this woman bathing and, he, he, and something stirs inside of him and he wants her. And he sends people to her and they bring her to him and he commits adultery with her. So he sleeps with Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah, one of his most faithful friends and loyal friends. 
And it was this betrayal and his denial that caused Nathan, nearly a year later, after God came to him and said, Nathan, go to David. Help him address this, this sin so that he's broken emotionally by it. See, Psalm 51 begins with David asking for mercy because he knows. He knows. He knows he's guilty. And forgiveness is what he's seeking because of God's goodness and kindness. He says, it's according to your unfailing love. It's according to your great compassion. He's deeply, his deeply hidden and suppressed emotions are finally being expressed. They're finally being confessed. He's dealing with it. He's facing it. They're coming out with this request, blot out my sin, my transgression. I got the image of the dry eraser versus the permanent marker. Some of us think of our sin as, as, as if it's written in permanent marker. David's story tells us, no, it's a dry erase. We can receive forgiveness from God. He says, erase my sin. Verse 2, wash them away. And it's that, that, what's that stick that you use? I don't even know what ours is. It's like when you get a stain on your, on your clothes and you just you rub it in and you let it sit for five minutes. Yeah, and then, it, and then it goes away. When I was a kid, we didn't have those. We just had grass stains from sliding into second base or playing run the bases or whatever it was. And we would just have dirty clothes. But today you got this erasure like that, right? Wash them, wipe them clean. That's what David's saying. Cancel the debt. Remove it from me. He's not making excuses. He's not blaming others. He's saying, I'm guilty. I have iniquity. I have transgression. And I have sin in my life. I've crossed the line. It was willful rebellion. I missed the mark. That's why he uses these three different words. It's what he's saying. I crossed the line. It was willful. He's not excusing it. He's addressing it. And he says, I missed the mark. I didn't follow you. Now, the late R.C. Sproul, knowing we are prone to downplay and justify our sin, he said this. Follow along on the side screens. It says, he says, when David pleads with God to blot out his transgressions, he's asking God to remove the stain from his soul to cover his unrighteousness, to cleanse him from the sin that is now a permanent part of his life. Unless he does something about it. He so, so he says, wash me. Wash me completely, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The ideas of forgiveness, Sproul writes, and cleansing, they're related, but they're not quite the same thing. In the New Testament, the Apostle John writes this, if we confess our sins... I was going to say some of us need to hear this, but all of us need to hear this. If we confess our sins, what does God do? He is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In a spirit of repentance, we go before God and we confess our sins and asking not only for the pardon, the removal of the penalty, but also the strength to refrain from doing that sin anymore. So as David does this in his psalm, he, we ask that our inclination to wickedness would also be eliminated. See, David's finally opening up. He's finally opening up emotionally about what's happening and eating him away at him internally. Now in verse 4, he says, against you, and you only have I sinned. And here we say, well, wait a minute, is that right? Well, remember, he's using a, a figure of speech saying, God, first and foremost, my sin is against you because all sin is against God. It's exactly what Joseph said in Genesis uh, 39. He said, how could I do this wicked thing and sleep with Potiphar's wife who was trying to, 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 to uh, seduce him? He says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned and I've done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right and you speak when you speak and justified when you judge. He's saying, I've sinned in a greater way against God than against everyone else. Yes, he sinned against Uriah. He sinned against Bathsheba and their families and Ilium, uh, uh, Bathsheba's um, 
uh, father and, and the whole family, the nation, but he's no longer denying it or minimizing it. He's emphasizing his offense before God. God knows it. God sees it. He's aware of it, and now finally David's admitting it. And in verses 5 through 7, we see that surely, uh, this is what David writes, I was sinful at birth. David's acknowledging he and we, we have a sinful nature. Apart from God, we have a sinful nature. We're sinners by nature and choice. It's what our statement of faith says in, in our statement of faith on, on the human condition, that we are sinners by nature and by choice. And David's acknowledging that he and we must seek what God desires, and that's truth and wisdom about what's happening within us dealing with the brokenness. When we're broken emotionally by sin, it's what's happening within the inner parts. He wants us dealing with our sin honestly and with transparency. And David continues and he says, verse 6, surely you desire truth in my inner parts. You teach me wisdom to know what's right and wrong in the inmost, innermost place. Cleanse me with hyssop. Cleanse me with hyssop, which is a reference to the ceremonial cleansing in the Old Testament. In like the book of Levit Leviticus, like verse 14, where lepers under the law would get cleansed. And they would dip this plant in the blood and, and, and cleanse them by applying the blood to the hyssop and, and, and in the sprinkling of the blood. You see, David's desire is that he would be purified from the disease, just like the lepers in the Old Testament, that he would be purified from the disease of sin. And he says, and I will, if you do this, Lord, if you do this, I will be clean. I will be clean if you do this. So wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. See, when we come to the place where we are expressing our sin and, and not... Uh, suppressing it, we're addressing it, uh, and we're broken emotionally by sin, we understand that we're in need of God's favor. We're in need of God's mercy because we're guilty. Now, there's words in the Bible about confessing our sin. In the Old Testament, there's a word that really means just simply to acknowledge what God says about sin. Acknowledging our sin to God. And in the New Testament, the word really means, literally, it's, it's the word homologia, which simply means to say the same thing about. What God says about my sin, I say about my sin. He's right. He's right. See, David's doing what so many fail to do. He's no longer denying it. He's no longer lying about it. He's no longer trying to uh, to, to, to hide it, but he's expressing it and confessing it. What are we doing with our sin? Are we really addressing it? Or are we like David who for a year just buried it, just tried to hide it, just tried to ignore it? See, when we're expressing and confessing our sin, we experience God who forgives us, who releases us from the guilt and the shame and the regret. So whatever you're holding on to, God wants you to let it go and give it to him. Acknowledging our sin and saying the same thing about it as God says. It was wrong. Forgive me. And he will because he is just and he is faithful. Now one of our greatest needs is coming to terms with our, terms with our brokenness and asking God for forgiveness. We see it as a need for others. I saw what they did. I saw what she did. I know what they're up, about, they're up to. I know what they're about. But what about the importance of it in our lives? One of the books I'm planning on reading over the next couple of months is uh, Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. But in its, in its summary about what it is and what, what drew me to this book is, is that he explains the importance of confronting the sins that we tolerate. There's respectable sins. Certainly we're like, wait a minute, but I haven't committed adultery. I haven't killed the, the spouse of the one I committed adultery with. 
So we tolerate, but instead we need to come to hate sin. Not just other sin, my sin, our sin. What are the actions and attitudes that we just tolerate? David's broken heart helped him to finally seek forgiveness. Guys, if you get nothing else out of this message today, recognize that as we continue to see these liberating advantages, the benefits of, of expressing and addressing our emotions is that we have a God who forgives. We have a God who forgives the worst in us. May we allow what breaks God's heart to break ours. May we be like that. See, David asks God to forgive him, but now, now he asks God, okay, change me. Change me from the inside out. And that's the second liberating advantage we see here, beginning in verse uh, 8. We see that we experience when we're expressing and not suppressing, we're addressing our sins. We experience God who changes us from within. This is his work that he initiates in us. Verse 8, David writes, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed, let them rejoice. Have you ever been so burdened and that you beat yourself up because of your sin and you just keep reliving it and going over it and just talking with yourself about it and talking with anyone who will listen to you about it and you just keep over and over and over? God's forgiven it. But now he wants to change you. And that's how David's feeling because he's, he's been living with his guilt and shame and regret. He knew it. He knew he was guilty. But he wants to hear now something different. Not that self-talk and that, that destructive nature of, uh, of, of, of attack that's coming at him saying, you're guilty, shame on you, regret, you're, you're unforgivable, you can't be forgiven. He wants the weight of his sin lifted off of him. He wants to be free of the penalty of the sin. He wants to hear joy and gladness and rejoicing again. Verse 9, he wants to know God no longer sees his sin. Notice, he writes, hide your face, not from me. Don't hide your face from me. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. How often do we keep rehearsing it and going over and over and over it again? Our situation when we sin. That's what David's doing. He's living with his sin. He can't imagine God will forgive him, but then when he does, he needs to learn to forgive himself and to recognize that God wants to and will change him. He needs to open his eyes and realize who God is. He's confessed it, and he's no longer holding on to it. And it's reminding me of this, this passage in Micah 7, 8 and 18 and 19. It's up on the side screens he, where Micah asks and answers this question. He says, who is a God? Listen to who our God is. Who is a God who pardons sin, who forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance, of his people? I've been reading through the Old Testament. I do daily devotions, and right now I'm right, I've been reading through uh, uh, my Old Testament. I've been reading through 1 Samuel. I just got to uh, where this is described with Bathsheba in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel. And man, over and over again, you see David doing the right thing, and then he's doing the wrong thing, and he's doing the right thing. He's, but he comes to terms with his sin because he, he confesses it. He addresses it. And, he, and then, then he goes on and he says, God, I want you to, I, I can't do this myself. You can't change yourself. Yeah, you can try harder and change for a little while and do some right things. But eventually, you're going to realize you, you can't do this yourself. You need the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to enable you to do this. And that's what Micah's saying here. God, you don't stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. A couple weeks ago, I, sh I shared that meaning of that word. Mercy is he delights to show, show us his favor. He is pleased with us. 
He doesn't stay angry forever, but he delights to show. So you will again, he, he says in verse 19, Micah does, you will again have compassion on us. You, tr- you will tread the sins underfoot and you'll hurl them. Look where he sends them. All our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Verse 10 and 11, back to uh, the Psalm 51, David said he wants a new start. Now, lately, I can't hit a fair way to save my life playing golf. And every once in a while, we want a mulligan, don't we? You know what a mulligan is? It's a do-over. It's another shot without a penalty. That's what David's asking for here. Has anybody ever wanted a do-over, a mulligan? Yes? I know some of you are golfers, and you're just lying right now. Show me your hands. Come on, you want, a, you want another shot, right? That's what David wanted. He wanted a second chance to start over without the penalty for a bad start. He wanted God to change him from the inside out. He wanted God to do something that he knew he couldn't do himself. He wanted God to help him. And that's why God sent us the Holy Spirit to walk with us and be with us and to help us In verse 12, David says he wants God to be the source of his joy to return him to his original position or condition in relationship with God, to forget his sin, to cover his sin. Have you ever come to this place where your joy comes from the Lord, that no matter what's happening, when we're broken emotionally by sin, we experience God the way God the way David experienced God. But when we remain in it, we won't and we don't see God as the author and the perfecter and the uh, creator and sustainer of our lives. When we confess our sin, we will. Hope Satan doesn't want us living forgiven or believing that we can be changed by God. He wants us working on our own efforts because he knows we're going to fail. Satan doesn't want us living with the knowledge that God changes us from within. It's the Holy Spirit's work in our lives that changes us. Now, the challenge for us is will we forgive ourselves from the guilt and the shame and the regret? Remember 1 John 1, 9 that says that if we confess our sins... Some of you, that's, what, that's the verse you just need to, to read over and over and over again and memorize it this week. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. And when we won't forgive, uh, con, uh, when we won't, um, uh, forgive ourselves for the sin after we've confessed our sin, we're saying that God's not faithful. We're saying that God's not just. Whether we know that intentionally or not, that is what we're saying. Do you believe that God is faithful and just? And if you do, whether you do or you don't, he is. But if you believe that, you won't hold on to it. You won't keep reliving it. You'll start letting go of it. David was learning to let it go and stop reliving it and allow his words of anguish to turn into words of praise. His pain turned to praise. He specifically mentioned as the author, David is, in 73 of the Psalms. So here in Psalm 51 and then in Psalm 103, he's trusting and believing and praising God. Listen to what he says in Psalm 103. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his what? His benefits. And here it is. He forgives all our sins. He heals all our diseases. He redeems your life from the pit, and he crowns us with his love and compassion. For as high, verse 11, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Amen? As far as the east is from the west. I couldn't wait to get to here. I wanted to be quoted this earlier, right? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I don't know if you're struggling with this, with any of this, but we need to allow God to do what God does. He forgives us. We need to believe this. He changes us. We need to trust this because he still wants to use us. I don't know when he said it, but it was probably one at the leadership, uh, global leadership summits years and years ago, but Pastor Craig Rochelle says, if you're not dead, you're not done. 
If you're not dead, God, you're not done, and God's not done with you. He wants to use you. You've got to start accepting what God says, whether it's your voice or others' voices. The voice you need to be led by and I need to be led by and we should be led by and we will be led by is God's voice. That means God's going to use you. He's going to use me. The question is, do we believe it? Because God's forgiveness is from the inside out and it's given to us to be used by God for his purpose. And that's to help others. This isn't just about you. He forgives you, he changes you, and he's now challenging us to be used by him to help others in whatever situation they find themselves in. And that's exactly what David says next. Beginning in verse uh, 13, uh, we experience God. This is the third liberating advantage. We experience God who uses us to help others turn back to him. That's his point of emphasis here. He says, uh, verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt. Save me from the penalty that I deserve. Save me from death. Oh God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Those, those verses there, from the time David surrendered to the temptation of sin, he had been out of God's service. He had been hiding. He had been denying, probably lying to others, lying to himself, certainly not even addressing it with God. But then God sent Nathan to talk to him. 2 Samuel 12, 1. That's what he says. So whatever our sin is, this doesn't have to, just like David, this doesn't have to be the end of our story. God still has a purpose and a use for us. Notice David's purpose with this with his promise of what he's going to do in verses 13, 14, and 15. I will teach sinners. I will sing of your righteousness, God. How you credit me with righteousness because of your righteousness from you. And I will declare your praise with my mouth and with my tongue. I'll do these things. I'll teach. I'll sing. I'll declare. Scripture commands us to help others when sin overtakes them. In the New Testament, you could read this on your own during the week, but just these first two verses in Galatians 6. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. He says, brothers, if someone's caught in a sin, beat them up? No. <laughs> no. You who are spiritual, restore them gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. This is one of those one another passages with a reciprocal pronoun. It's mutual. It's a both and, not an either or. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ, which is to love God and love people, right? Big picture. David's willingness to do this and get back into service uh, is, he, is, that, is because he understands his purpose after receiving forgiveness. He's teaching. He's singing. He's declaring the praises of God. He's broken but not defeated. He understands God's righteousness because he's been a recipient of it. He's not going to allow his story be, to be uh, uh, a barrier to, 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 to presenting and representing God's glory. Sometimes I can see that with this. Sometimes I can't. I got a little more time here. I want to touch on this something real quick here. Church, I want us to think about something very Seriously here. Have you noticed that the church sometimes has a problem with this? Helping others who have sinned? How the people of God experience this, we receive it, but often we fail at helping others to do the same. You know, in the past few years, we really have come, become aware of how we live in this, this world of cancel culture. You know, this means that maybe you've witnessed it or experienced it, and we tend to cancel those who, who think differently, act differently, believe differently. But this happens in the church too. Sometimes we cancel those who've sinned. We go, oh, we, we can't forgive that. You may have confessed it, but no, 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 we're not, that, you've crossed the line way too far. Rather than reach out with God's grace and truth. This means just as we experience forgiveness through faith and repentance, we are called to be not just recipients, as Paul David Tripp often says, not just recipients, 
but instruments of God's grace and truth. We've got to stop being selfish with just receiving, but we've got to start giving the same to others. This, mean God, this means that God desires to use us for our good and for his glory. You see, Christianity in our country and even globally is at a crossroads because we don't often see or hear an emphasis on the importance of repentance in relationship to forgiveness. Everybody's yelling and screaming at each other about what they're doing wrong and what they're doing wrong and what they're doing wrong as if all they do is right. That's a lie. This morning, I want to be clear that we have a responsibility to live faithfully, and this looks like us doing whatever it takes to help others turn back to God. It starts with all of us understanding what God wants in verses 16 and 19, and then we're finished. David writes, you do not delight in in sacrifice. What he's talking about is external sacrifice without a connection with the heart and, and being broken emotionally by sin in, in, our, in our case today. And David says, or I would bring it, you don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken spirit that understands our own sin. A broken and contrite heart that's crushed when we sin and say, I hate sin, my sin as much as others sin. Oh, God, and you won't despise me. You'll delight in me. In your good pleasure, he goes on and says, make Zion prosper, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then there'll be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. What David's saying is because of his experience, he prays for, for God's kingdom, for God's reputation to be known. He delights, to take the ple- uh, he delights and takes pleasure in what's happening internally in the lives of his people. A broken and con- uh, spirit and contrite heart, a life that grieves what God grieves and lives the way that God calls us to live. That's a life that grieves what God grieves because it, 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 he grieves sin that creates division between us. First, it requires reconciliation with him. Have you been reconciled to God? Have you entered into a formal relationship, a real relationship, a genuine relationship where you're following him, you're listening to him, you're you're living for him? God desires lives that are forgiven, transformed, they're changed. Lives that are being used for the glory of God. So what does this look like for us? Everyone has emotions. We have our own guilt. We have our own shame. We have our own regret, whether we're believers or not. And the hope for the believer is there is a way to handle these. The hope for the unbeliever, there's a hope for you too. You just have to receive God's grace, God's mercy, and this truth. See, many who commit commit sin feel they have no hope. David's story tells us that's just not true true. It's not true. We can be forgiven and changed and used by God. So when we're expressing our emotion and confessing our sin, broken emotionally by our sin, God has something for us. And the application of this message is threefold. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up as I'm explaining this. The application of this is some of us need to come out of the shadows. Some of us need to confess and admit our sin. Stop burying it. Stop hiding it. Stop denying it. Stop lying about it. David's life was a mess because he messed up. But then he confessed and he was forgiven. Yes, it took uh, uh, Nathan to come to him a year later. That's okay. Sometimes we need someone else to come to us, a friend, to speak to us and say, this isn't right in your life. How will we receive that? David knew immediately that that's me. And then and he opened up. He released his emotions, his grief, his guilt, his shame, his regret. See, our lives may be a mess, but when we mess up, we need to fess up. We need to confess our sin. And be released from the guilt of our sin. 
Now, some of us are still stuck with, but I'm not David. You're right, you're not. But let's go back to the respectable sins. Maybe you're expressing pride. Maybe it's not external. Maybe it's internal, but it's like, I'm not David. I'm better than David. Maybe you have attitudes with relationships, with your spouse, with your kids, with your parents, with your family, with your coworkers, with your neighbors. These attitudes and actions are sin that need to be confessed. And God will forgive you. Secondly, we need to realize, some of us need to realize that only God can change us. Some of us are just trying too hard on our own. And we're wondering why it seems like we're on that, literally like a treadmill. We're not getting anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We keep moving, but we're just staying in the same spot. We need the help of God. The Holy Spirit, the counselor of God, to do a work from, from the inside out and change us. Acknowledging I can't change this. We all could tell stories. I could tell stories. We'd be here until about four or five at least. And that's just the, the abridged version. When I came to realize that only God could change me, oh, the benefits, the liberating advantages of being set free from trying to be, well, I'm just going to be me. No, that's awful theology. Just be you. No, be who God designed you to be, forgiven and following him, changed by him so that you can be used by him. And that's our third part of our, 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 our application here. Some of us need to know that God uses broken things. So many of you could tell stories of the brokenness that you've been in that you are in, and, and sadly, we're going to still face brokenness in this world. But God uses broken things, and that means he uses you, and he uses me. How in the world am I up here? Who am I? I feel like Isaiah. Who am I? I, I, I send me, God, because I'm going to trust you to use me. I have no right to be up here because of my brokenness, but God's forgiven me. He's continually changing me, and he's going to keep using me. Although I'll be on a brief pause, what I, this three-month sabbatical that I have coming up, that's going to be tough for me, but he's still going to use me in a different way. I, oh, I, I, I know it because he promises it. But I want us to know that God uses broken things to help other broken things. It's not just about doing ministry, showing up and doing the chairs and doing the, the worship in the park and uh, helping in kids' ministry, youth ministry, whatever it is. It's about helping others come to faith in Jesus and continually following Jesus once they come into a relationship with him. Would you pray with me? Father God, I pray that all of us, as we sing this last song, would be gracefully broken that we would allow, allow David's story to be all about your glory. Man, I would not want my sin placed in any book, let alone your book, like his was. But Lord, you forgave him just as you forgive us. You're changing him as he's writing this, this, this passage and you're changing us. And you want to use us as you were using him for your glory. Lord, I pray that all of us would be in relationship with you simply because we say, Lord, I need you. That we confess our sin to you and we trust that you will change us and use us because you do change us from the inside out. Thank you for David's story. And thank you for every single story that's here, Lord, that you change us. You use broken things. We praise you for that. We love you for that. We believe in you for that. What a great God we have. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks, Joe. Would you stand with us? Let this song be our prayer. 
yes, we are broken, but we are not defeated. Where there is sin, grace abounds.
what a great song to close this service with. God wants us to be gracefully broken. It's our desire that we would all enter into a relationship with Christ, develop that relationship, and to continue to grow in that relationship, to know the God of David's story, to know the God of Hope's story, to know the God of our story, those of us who know with him, know, know him and walk with him and live for him, that more and more people become a part of the family of God. Pray that we would know the forgiveness of God because we've experienced it. We know that we've been changed and transformed by God because we've experienced it. And we're being used by God because we continually, over and over again, experience it. Go and live out this gospel message. You're dismissed.